All right. You ready? Yeah. Ready. I just pressed record. We are on the record. Boo. Boys and girls, ghouls and goblins, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm so excited right now because we're at one of those moments in history where you'll go, I was there. If you're listening to this later on, you'll be like, I was there, plus however many hours from the time we recorded this that you were able to listen to this. Do your yeah. own math. I'm joined by Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hi, everybody. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Part man, part machine, all party robot 8000. Half Pegasus, half unicorn, all fraternity brother. That's me. Gentlemen, uh, we've got a lot of exciting news happening. A lot of exciting news bursting at the seams. And I'm trying to, like, which story do I lead with? And frankly, uh, you know, imagine, like, you were... I don't know, like 19 was 33 or something like that and you walk through a comic book store or like a newsstand the funny pages yeah and you pick up a thing called detective comics oh. on the cover yeah sure guy this like man bat kind of guy yeah you know like that's was, pretty awesome was was it 1933 really was when when that started something like that i'm getting my fat getting the number wrong it was the 30s so yeah. maybe 38 39 somewhere yeah, around there that's okay? amazing 1333 was the first recorded. Uh, well, it, it was Batman. Very few people know that it was actually Jeffrey Chaucer was the first to write down the tale of of the Batfellow as it was yeah. written. F E L L the Bat Gentleman. Uh, uh, yeah, F E L L O W E was how it was originally spelled. So then you like you know maybe like you're a kid and you're turning on the radio and then you hear 1939 May 1939. So you're a kid, and you, you're, you're hearing the radio, and all of a sudden you hear, like, this radio drama of, like, Superman. Wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. No. 1970s, man. you turn on your TV, and there's this guy wearing this, like, American flag suit on a badass motorcycle ready to, like, jump over some buses or something. With, with, with like, a, wait, are you talking about Evil Knievel or, or the yeah. 1970s Captain America with the, with the plastic shield? Evil Knievel. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. You're like, I believe in heroes. <laughs> Right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are in the presence of one of those moments that 50 years from now, 100 years from now, as it's sleepy movie theaters, as it becomes its own franchise, we'll be like, I remember when. I got into it before it was cool. What is it? What is it? I must know. It's a real-life superhero. Who? Um, we think. Do, do I know him? No, I don't know him. I don't know. Maybe you do know him. D does he have... Does he have like for real superpowers or is he is he he's he's like like you know like spider-man can like climb and stuff this sure. guy's got powers like like what? the animal he's named for comparable oh. to spider-man <laughs> perhaps perhaps uh so <laughs> see he's themed after an animal what kind of animal is it is it is it like badger man better better than a badger yeah the tasmanian raccoon that, i feel like that could be its own television show Better than a badger? <laughs> Better than we a badger? We got photos. We got videos. We've got a name. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Goatman. Goat <laughs> <man. laughs> Running up the craggy hills of Utah. <laughs> Middle like, Utah. Photos. Some guy. Goat man. Some goat. Looks like a man. Man looks like a goat. Some half-breed goat man kind of thing. Good, I'm Climbing looking up, up the goat hill man. Where only goats would go. Photos. Right. Video. Fact. Officials work to identify Goatman seen trailing the herd in Utah mountains. Is that him? Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a guy like in a little Bo Peep lamb costume, complete with a big old bell. <laughs> you know, it, it's the Goatman, Brian. Uh, Listen, he's out it's there. really up to us to judge, Brian. <laughs> he, he's solving crimes, man, and through Utah. Like I feel like this is going to become a presidential issue where they, it's like Mitt Romney. Can you say on the record that you know the goat man? <laughs> Will you apprehend the goat man? Is it, yeah. is it like he's like following the herd, protect them from like wolves and coyotes and hillbillies with shotguns, man? How, how on earth can he? This guy's just gonna get shot by somebody poaching goats. This guy, there you go. You make this assumption that it's just some dude in like you know some furry costume. You got lost from like you know one of them. <laughs> You don't West think Coast comic conventions where he got a little bit drunk and went wandering and ended up on a hill. I'm Goatman. 
<laughs> no, it's I'm Goat Man. <laughs> you taught the authorities are working to identify a man spotted dressed as a, a goat suit among a herd of wild goats in the mountains of northern Utah. The photographer who snapped the blurry photos of the individual dubbed Goat Man told Fox affiliate they spotted the man as he was descending Ben Lomond Peak. That's awesome. He was it's clumsy. Like a sheer rock face. He was clumsy, working his way down the cliff, trying to catch up with the rest of the herd. <laughs> with the binoculars, I could clearly see it was a guy dressed up in a homemade goat suit. <laughs> clearly, what if you know, this that's is hearsay. Like, but what if this is like the beginning of his training? Yeah. Like he needs to live amongst the goats and know that he can be one of them before he can learn to harness their powers and protect his own people. Yeah. He's got it, like, you know, before Batman went to, you know, the ninja monastery, you know, he was tripping all over the place. This could be part of the training. Maybe there is a ninja goat monastery up in the mountains of Utah somewhere. I think that was in the Book of Mormon. I'm pretty sure. Crichton said the man appeared to be wearing heavy gloves so he could crawl on his hands and knees. He also said that at one point the man lifted his mask and looked up at him for several minutes. He kind of slouched down like he was getting nervous or was feeling really self-conscious. <laughs> Right, man. No, it's not easy being a superhero, Brian. He actually got off his hands and knees and sat on the hill for several minutes until he thought I was gone. <laughs> you know, it's people like you are why it made it hard for Spider-Man to become a hero. <clears throat> it's why Batman is considered a vigilante and not a hero, Brian. Phil why Iron Man was forced to reveal himself. People like you. Phil Douglas of the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources said the person wearing the goat suit is doing nothing illegal, but he worries that the man is unaware of the dangers. Maybe that guy is unaware of the dangers that he's going to be protected from now that Goat Man's on the case. <laughs> My very first concern is the person doesn't understand the risks, Douglas said. Who's to say what could happen? This is awesome. you what's going to happen. Uh, safety, protection, <laughs> truth, justice, and the American way. He worries that the goat man may be accidentally shot or could be attacked by a real goat. They may get agitated. They're territorial. They are, after all, wild animals, he says. This person puts on a goat suit, he changes the game. But not, But as long as he accepts responsibility... You change things. <laughs> it's not illegal. <laughs> wow. So what's what's Goatman's nemesis going to be? Uh, apparently it's Douglas because it says here Douglas said, "Wow, yeah, old, old Peep and Tom McGirt, <laughs> yes. who's just sitting there keeping an eye on old goats." Wildlife officials received an anonymous call Thursday from an agitated man. The caller simply said, "Leave Goatman alone. He's done nothing wrong." <laughs> 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 wow <laughs> this is amazing dude this is and, and by the way i'm a hundred percent for this what's what's the quote from uh, i always heard it was salvador dolly who said who said yeah hey, uh, you know we need we need goat man that was what salvador <laughs> dolly said no no salvador dolly said what a pity that so little of what could happen does which is like the world needs more weird and this is about as weird as it gets we need more goat men out there I'm telling you, man. I, I'm trying to imagine he's protecting us, and you just sort of dismiss the whole idea. I mean, what are some of the supervillains he might? I mean, his own nemesis he's, is probably like a Greek guy looking for like make an hero. But well, the, the, oh, jeez. The, the problem is, he, it's like he's probably awesome at like weed man. <laughs> he can totally eat weed man or paper man. <laughs> tin can man. Yeah, tin can man. <laughs> like you know, you're like. Middle of the You'll night, never get me, somebody. goat man. It's me, Tin Can Man. <laughs> we're like we're out, like we're mugging, we're like a gang mugging somebody like that. A cold wind blows by. We can hear coyotes <laughs> in the mountains, and all of a sudden we hear a bell. <laughs> what is that? Oh no, I've heard man. about him. It's oh goat yeah, tinkle, like you start tinkle, hearing tinkle. like like buzz, like from different, <laughs> you know, like. Like from different areas, like, but, like no, that's like laugh. that's like that's like when like the chips are down at the sporting event and they only the goat man could save them. One person goes ah, and then someone else goes ah, and then another person joins in. Finally, the whole stadium's going ah 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 ah. 
I'm Goatman. Goatman needs a theme. Um, like a like a, a stirring uh, instrumental, or like like a like a, a song. I'd go for any. Uh, have you heard that video of the goat that yells like a man? Yes. <laughs> like I feel like that should be his battle cry. Does he get a catchphrase? <laughs> yes. Um, Hold on, if you don't mind, I actually are you have... done chewing on that? <laughs> Here's here's his his battle cry. <laughs> All right, give me your money, lady. <laughs> I can't tell which one is you guys and which is Goat Man. I don't know, man. I I I, I don't want to mess with anything with Goat Man out on the hills. Ah! Ah! Did you guys hear that? Go it's Goat Man. Studies. <laughs> I'm in love with Goat Man. Goat Man was safe until we brought in the horny Scotsman. <laughs> oh no! What? Hey there, Goat Man. <laughs> no. I'll make you yell like a man. I finally trapped you where I wanted you, at the edge of a hill. You know, I like that because it pushes back. I'm the horny Scotsman. Oh I'm a sister goat man. Climb down this goat man. So, okay, so in all seriousness, what do you think this guy is? <laughs> Number one, that's the funniest time that phrase has ever been said in the English language. <laughs> All right. Is so we're talking it, about Goat Man? It's never been anything else other than about Goat Man. It's not like we started talking about monetary policy <laughs> and then we veered into Goat Man. Like, it just been about Goat Man. It's like no, but in all seriousness. No, but in all seriousness, let's get back to the point man. at hand about Goat Man. Uh, no, do you think? Uh, do you think this guy was a researcher or furry? I'm gonna put him more towards the furry category. <laughs> <laughs> man, uh, but uh, for for that guy. For that guy, though, like he's he's living the dream. He's like, I want to be part of the herd, running free with goats. I think it sounded like a great idea on paper. <laughs> and then some guy took pictures really? of him. When does that ever sound like a great idea? Like when in the cold reality? How of do you end up on the mountain? When does this? <laughs> when does this? You start off like oh, I'm gonna dress up a goat. I'm gonna go. And you get up the mountain. You're like, oh my god, this is steep. Could be There's a, a crackhead. Tiny little goat feet. Got a hold of the wrong stuff. Told him to climb up a mountain and act a goat. Yeah. It just sort of snowballed from there. Did he like go through different sketches? Was he like Raccoon Man? Nah, no, Cartman did that on South Park. Ah, uh, what? What hasn't been taken? Goat Man. Salamander Man. Yeah. Didn't like crawling on his belly, you know. No. He, was a... he was the Salamander. <laughs> what? Uh, what would you? Like okay, so where, what where, kind of barnyard animal would do, no, like, no, 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 no. So, so like we we are the three of us are on a weird things retreat. We're in a cabin in the woods. The weird things offsite. That's right. So it's it's sort of it's a once annual uh, retreat where the three of us focus and meditate on what it means to do weird things, and then uh, we see out out the window we see goat man crawling around, and the first thing we think of is let's make this guy's day. Let's. Let's whip up three bad guys for him to beat, and we'll just show up to menace him, and he'll defeat us with his goat powders. Goat powders. Goat powders. Well, that's probably what he does. Is he he throws goat powder, powder in your face. Um, because he's so coked up up on the hill, dressed like a goat. Goat, goat powder is actually just cocaine. He's it's high just, as I a kite. bath salts. Yeah. Um. No, number one, if I really want to make his day, I'm throwing out, you know, a bunch of aluminum cans and a half of working bike horn. And he's just <laughs> going to go nuts. It turns out he doesn't want to fight crime. He just wants to chew on things. He likes chewing on things. He's learned. Listen, Brian, he's like, he's like, like Mowgli. Like, he's just raised among goats. Oh, my God. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm dressing up somebody as like a tin can robot to go steal one of the sheep. Man, it, it's almost like 
trying to out weird the weirdest guy in the room where it's just like you want to take it to another level and you've got like glowing lights and you start like shouting in binary just zero zero one you just get more and more mad you're like zero zero one one zero one one zero one 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 zero zero and, and then you like you look over and he's like licking the paint so hard it's coming off it's it, it becomes like this game of weird chicken to see who's gonna crack first the guy who swears he's a robot from outer space or 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 goat man you can't out weird a guy like that. Some men just want to watch the world become goat men. <laughs> <laughs> Some men just want to eat all the grass in the world. I mean, yeah. think about it. Like, it's one thing. Like, I'm gonna make myself a badass superhero costume and patrol the mean streets of, you know, a rural Utah. You know? <laughs> but, but when you decide to dress up like a goat, go where you don't plan on being seen. So you're kind of like, who's the costume for? <laughs> Zombies well, imagine, to fool the goats. Imagine this, because you know, there's always like the crossovers. Like even like you know, like Punisher did a crossover with Archie. You know, like what is like in the real world superhero realm, what is the like Phoenix Jones and Goatman adventure that like I feel like it would be like him and Iron Fist. <laughs> Goatman and Iron Fist or or Power Man or something. That sounds so horrible, Brian. That <laughs> sounds like a whole nother genre of entertainment. I think it's a good time to thank our sponsors. You know, I moved out to L.A., and then two months later, I was working on a film called Goat Man and Iron Fist. <laughs> I, thought my, I thought it would be the door I've opening been a to bad my career. bad boy. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what. Let me tell you guys about a little book, okay? It's written by Peter Welch, and it's called... Uh, and then I thought I was a fish. Listen, it's available on Kindle. You can head on over to Amazon and go for two ninety nine. dollars Buy it. Put it all up on your Kindle. Here's the description. In the summer of 2000, I combined drugs, stress, sleep deprivation, and an above-average share of youthful recklessness to produce a three-month psychotic episode. I lost all touch with the reality and spent those months taking wild swings getting it back. After a stint in a mental institution, Grand Theft Auto, a handful of monks, and a surprising number of hippies, I came back. Twelve years after that, I decided to write it down. Uh, it was only published in May 1st, 2012, and it's a reader, or sorry, a listener of this podcast. Go and support somebody who is truly freaking weird. This is amazing. This guy, this is the guy who has to take on Goat Man. Well, there we go. Peter Welch. We very much thank him for uh, for sponsoring this podcast. And if you would like to sponsor this podcast, head on over to weirdthings.com slash sponsor, and you can get your listener shout out for 30 bucks. Hey, look at that. Here I thought it was a fish, and then I bought a Weird Thing sponsor. All right, gentlemen. Uh, trying to figure out the uh, – I don't want to make too light of what happened – but uh, I think there is comedic value in there. Um, Brian, you do some crazy, dangerous stuff in your show. Uh, mitigated danger. It certainly looks crazy and it looks dangerous. But, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, I'm trying to keep it safe within reason. But, yes, uh, some nutty things happen in my stage show for sure. So uh, you eat fire. Yeah, yeah. You like uh, you ever walk on broken glass? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I used to. I used to get someone from the audience and have them piggyback, and then I would jump up and down in the broken glass. And I was always, I always knew it was kind of a roll of the dice. It was just like rush roulette with my feet. I was just jumping. I never, never sliced the hell out of them. But uh, always thought it could happen. Tell me about the time that you maimed twenty-one people in the middle of your act. Oh dear God, I know exactly where this is headed. And what I've, was that like? <laughs> I, no, you see, I've never done that. What Although about the screams of agony, you know, make it stop, make it stop, please, please, God, make it stop. Well, what, uh, as far as I understand, the right thing to do is to shout at them that they're not believing hard enough when that ah. happens. <laughs> well, just... that they're not releasing the power within well you keep all that power in there and next thing you know if they were at peak performance then their feet would would turn to lead and they would be able to walk all around in it with they'd have melted feet though yeah lead melts but so at least 21 people at a tony robbins event were treated for serious burns after doing a walk on fire and this is an event he's been doing for three decades tons of times 
And I've heard anecdotally that, like, the, you, do, you know, he does it in Hawaii, that the hospital there, they frequently get people showing up with burns on their feet the day after the walk on fire. Wow. Because no one wants to be the, the big, the big, you know, yeah. boom daddy that, you know, uh, decided to, to, you know, be the burn foot guy at the Tony Robbins thing. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, I would say in his defense, every time I've seen him presented, it's not presented as a supernatural thing. It's presented like skydiving or whatever else, just getting over your fear. And, and I know a lot of skeptics are like, ah, he's, you know, he's trying, like, well, anytime you can bring, you know, 6,000 people outside and have them walk on fire, you're not kind of, it's not like saying it's ghosts, you know. Right. But right. Yeah. there is an important safety factor here. And apparently, I don't know what happened, you know, why, you know, you can walk in on fire, walk in on coals. There's a right way to do it, an even better way to do it, not do it at all. But yeah. uh, apparently maybe some protocols weren't followed, or maybe they got a bunch of tender-footed people. So 21 people were burned at this event. So what – all right. So I was thinking about this a lot. What do you think is different in this particular situation than than before? Like is it just that thing where – was Tony off his game? No. Because normally Tony's so into his game, everyone's so dialed in that nobody wants to admit that they're the hot footed dude. And no. so, like, was he, did he kind of suck? So, like, it just, once that damn broke, of so like, my feet are literally burning. Wait a minute. So, you think it's a case where, like, he didn't give as motivational a talk as he usually did. And so, like, he at wasn't, some point. He was unleashing his own power. Exactly. So, at some point, like, dominoes started falling, and all of a sudden, people, like, were like, because because there's sort of this this herd mentality, right? That's part of how group group hypnosis and mass hysteria works. Is you sort of want to go along with whatever the vibe is that everyone else is is feeling, and it might be a case where he didn't nail his motivational talk, and all of a sudden in the calculus, they're like, well, do I want to be the lone guy saying, uh, no, I actually thought it was a really good presentation, and it was awesome that I walked on fire, and I mean. It's a little bit tender, but I, you know, it's not bad. Or do I want to be part of the screaming herd of twenty-one people shouting, "My feet, my feet"? Well, it just, it just seems like that would be a very like once that damn bursts, you know, like once, once the you know, the emperor's new clothes, like once, you know, once it, the the followers' burned feet, you know, uh, is revealed, then kind of it's more likely that people are going to be like, no, my feet are also really hurting. See, this is tough because I would love to do group instruction on fire eating, but it's it's this liability thing that terrifies me, you know? Yeah, and, and apparently I had 12 lanes of hot coals, and you've got to wait a certain amount of time for them to get to a certain point. And there are a couple of little factors that can play into, like, you know, moisture can make things stick to your feet. You don't want to stick how long you stand there, uh, a lot of little factors come into play. And I, I don't know, you know, really what happened here. But, you know, when you, you, you get, you hear the descriptions of, I heard walls of pain, screams of agony. You know, it's like it was ser people seriously hurting, like they were being tortured. First one person, then a couple minutes later, another, and another, and a line of people walking on the fire. So, uh, yeah, it's a... Uh, you know, people who do it, you know, go, ah, you know, they, it's a big moment in their life because you get people who have never pushed themselves outside an envelope like that. And when they do successfully do it, it makes them feel excited and empowered to do. And I understand. I do understand the the psychological value of something yeah. like that. But now, so what do you think it is? Do you think it, it, I mean, I would love to be a fly on the wall like and it turns out like there's just Tony Robbins. He's smoking cigarettes, you know, in his room. It's just like, oh, great. A whole Passel of freaking whiners. Whiners! He leans out the window, shouts, cry babies! Well, I was trying to find the statement on his website about it. Uh, just Pencil kind of... and Tony Robbins is maybe my new favorite character. Because <laughs> <laughs> he has such a calm kind of, uh, you know, exterior. Like, what if, like, as soon as that door shuts, he's just so petty. Yes! Petty Tony Robbins. Petty Tony Robbins. They're like... Was it so hard? I, I, I listen. It's fine. Like I'll drink Coke Zero, but like I like Coke. <laughs> Is having an opinion against the law? I'm petulant, Tony Robbins. I'll tell you what, though. In in Tony Robbins's defense, and and this is one of the weird things. Like he was um, in Shallow How. He was in Shallow How. Played Banana Hands. It was a hell of a role. But the important thing is, uh, man, when you uh, 
when you are in a high stress situation, uh, it feels really, really good to listen to someone like Tony Robbins just just sketch out what success might look like and and just if you could place yourself in that vision for even a second like that's enough go-go juice to make you dare to get on stage and fail in front of a bunch of people you know i mean it's like i mean it's like i i understand on the on, there, there's two sides I'm, I'm really of two minds on the one hand i'm super annoyed that so much of neurolinguistic program programming is just totally made up pseudoscientific bs on the flip side uh, there are an awful lot of people who definitely attempt things that they wouldn't normally attempt because they hear, you know, these these rah rah speeches from folks like Tony Robbins. And so, uh, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to want to hate on. I but mean, people are more likely to do things because they think they have magic beans in their pocket. No, not not so much magic beans, but but like a, it's. L let's say you do a two hour session or whatever. Not magic beans, success beans. <laughs> yeah, let's say you spend two hours just picturing. Uh, picturing what it would look like to be successful, because that's the biggest problem. Is is there there is truth to the fact that that you can't you can't I'm, outpace where you feel like you deserve to be, right? I'm and ten foot tall. I've got a lightsaber. There you okay. go. <laughs> going all right. I'm going with this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I no. I'm on, I'm on a scooter, and I've got two fat people on scooters with me, and we all ride like a like a team. Oh, it's like that great photo of like the two fat twins yeah. riding motorcycles. Exactly. No, I'm, 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 but I'm in the middle and I'm their leader. There you go. <laughs> pound for pound, the biggest gang there is. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to be buried in, was it that piano box or something? Something like that, yeah. But yeah, all right, Brian, I'm visualizing. And I really, I feel like I'm outpacing my station. Okay, good. Well, then I need you to, uh, I need you to uh, uh, picture, you know, all those haters, all those naysayers. I need you to make their voices. I need you to make their voices squeaky and insignificant. And I need you to take their pictures and put them in the sun. And do you feel, do you feel empowered? Do you feel like you have what it takes to seize the moment and achieve the ultimate pinnacle of rocket sauce? I mean, I, I see where that is, where that can be a thing, you know? I think for me, something like that is hard because, like, it's hard to listen to other people's criticism when you're yelling at yourself so loudly. Yes, yes. And so, like, reducing that voice, you know, to a lower thing is a different situation. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess here's the only thing that rubbed me the wrong way about the Tony Robbins thing. It's like, all right, let's take him at face value that like this is like all best intentions that all Z is doing is just trying to is a fair like people are paying money for a fair trade of getting their minds right because he's got this way of putting their minds in a certain alignment that will make them more successful right right uh, and this is part of it this is part of his it's, his it's a confidence boost like look i'm gonna say some things and historically for millions of people whenever i say these things they report that they feel like they're ready to tackle things that they would normally tackle. So come on so over like, and do that. Here's the thing. If something like this happens, then that means theoretically, if this was all legit or, and, and it might be, I'm not saying it isn't, but like, wait, wait, it would wait. be like, you'd be like, Oh, somebody screwed up. We shouldn't have done it when it was this temperature. We shouldn't have done it. You know, we should have waited an extra 45 now, minutes. Okay, for, now, for well, that, that's one way. Or what he could do is petty. Tony Robbins could be like, you didn't believe. You told me you had what it took. Well, no, that's, I mean, that, that's the thing. He's like, I, I just, I kind of feel like if they're, if it's legit, then explain it. Like, because like legit things go wrong all the time. Mm -hmm. People you get have, you have some things. of the, the victim mentality where people are blaming themselves. A guy going, he didn't think that he was in the right state. No. Oh, no. Yeah. You were in the right, the wrong state by far. You were the one where you walked on the freaking hot coals and got burned. But 21 people out of 6,000, though, you think it's statistically, though, that's less than 1%. Oh, I mean that's way less. That's uh, that's what. That's that's a third of a per percent. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, man, that ain't nothing. Six thousand people, twenty-one of them got crybaby burns. Man, look, this guy gave you the secret to peak performance. Why don't you, why don't you take a deep breath and focus your thetans and <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna mix. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell you. Look, um, I don't shuffle know. on up to Candy Mountain. Yeah, exactly. It's, I don't it's know, dope, man. I'm so of two minds. <laughs> I'm so of two minds because people really seem to, it, it, it is, you it is. You can burn hoofs, <laughs> goat man. Goat man. 
I eat the coals. <laughs> you guys smell kebab? <laughs> Goat man, fight you! Uh, yeah, I, I kind of, I, I think some of the stuff that comes out of his, his books and stuff is kind of silly, but I also think that he's inspired a lot of people. And I think there's a lot of people, you know, as much as I love science and stuff, you know, you're not going to find a lot about how to wake up each day and get excited about the work you have to do in front of you. And there's... Well, and, and that's the thing is uh, there, there are areas that, you know, the real frontiers of psychology... Right. For example, pain management. Pain is is insane. Like like we don't understand. Modern science doesn't really understand uh, how or why it works and why placebos are so powerful for reducing pain or whatever. Um, why one percent of Tony Robbins attendees are such sissies? <laughs> yes, exactly. But it's like, but likewise, you know, the 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 science. And I'm I'm doing air quotes for anybody not watching live. Uh, the science of success. I mean, at some level, you got to start somewhere. And with with the not quite so scientific process of, you know, a examining what people who are successful tend to do and having a seminar where you talk about those things and, you know, take other people who are, you know, in the middle of trying their first sales job or, or I don't know, quitting their job from Dell to try to pursue a career as a magician and maybe need to hear about the possibility that they need to get off their ass and work really hard every day. You know, even if it's a lie, you know, it, it's a lie that gets you off your ass and 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 get stuff happening. So I don't know. It's it's yeah, it's not a lie that makes you like risk your life by walking on hot coals or something. Well, yeah, but, hey, but, no, but, but even then, it's really not. I know. What I you mean, mean, I agree. Know. I totally yeah. agree. I'm just. Yeah, I'm I don't do know. my drinking acid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least it's not a lie that involves like snakes and arsenic. <laughs> Ooh, master level course. <laughs> Uh, hey, I got something to tell you guys about. How about a little uh, Con Langry? Listen, Con Langry has sponsored this podcast a couple times, and it is a podcast about constructed languages. Like, they don't talk about the cop-outs that Brian mentioned the last time that we that Con Langry sponsored this podcast. Brian talked about how a lot of uh, invented language in movies and film are just real languages that they call like oh it's not french it's called borders like uh and they don't talk about that they talk about actual well-developed language with actual grammars and good lexicons of words so how about you go listen to it con langry is the podcast they they talk about it really is good if you're can, fascinated can you by that element of science fiction c-o-n-l-a-n-g-e-r-y con langry if you're interested in that element of science fiction and fantasy, they are the best in the beeswax. Are they talking about uh, Dothraki? Are they got to talk about Dothraki? They were, yeah. I know when, when Game of Thrones first uh, came on, they talked a lot about Dothraki. There's, yeah, they're, they're awesome. Man, we got I like, smart... I like Brian's criticism. Like, ah, it's not a real language. They just changed this. <laughs> you know? Well, no, no, no. I'm just saying that uh, I, I, if I remember correctly, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit I'm dumb about everything, but, you, you know, I took that class, uh, Languages of Science Fiction, back in college. Yeah. And that was one of the – we learned a bunch of the tricks that they do. If they don't feel like actually getting off their ass and synthesizing Inventing a new language a lang from scratch. Like, for example, Dune. I think we talked about how Dune was all just was Arabic. Arabic. Yeah. yeah. Which was kind of fair enough because in the actual the history of Dune, there's, yeah, you know, it, it would have come from Earth. Yeah. But yeah, I want a new language. One of a con language us. did they want they wanted to point out very specifically that they don't they don't talk about the languages that use the tricks. They talk about real hardcore mother trucking uh, invented language. Man, do you think they talked about the? Um... What's that awesome book that was supposed to be a uh, mysterious language and uh, well, no, not Hustler. Uh, what, what, what's the what's the one? It's 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 a written book and uh, and that nobody could translate. The Voynich Manuscript? Picture books. Yes, probably. Whatever whatever Andrew's saying is very likely correct because uh, it's it's that it's a one where uh, I mean the documentary I saw recently was like the way that it was likely constructed was with just a series of 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 two to three syllable uh letter syllables or symbols that were just sort of haphazardly constructed together does that sound right 
Like Goat Man and Iron Fist? <laughs> Goat Man and Iron Fist, yes. Gentlemen, August 5th, Mars. Wait. Curiosity Rover landing. I, uh,. I want you to keep doing the rest of the segment. <laughs> I was just thinking Unsworth. the same thing. Oh, let's, <laughs> Space like... <laughs> gears digging dust. into surface. Now, is this the is this the the rover that um, uh, n- number one? I know that NASA put out that trailer recently. What was it the seven minutes of terror that they were talking about? Yeah, this is that same one, and this is the same one that's equipped with an unprecedented amount of gizmos to look for life. Is that right? That is correct, sir. So the Mars Curiosity rover is going to have uh, the most advanced tools we've ever been able to put on the surface of Mars and to try to look for organic molecules in the soil. Dude, this is huge. Now, to take people back, you remember You remember this would not be the first time that we've had a Mars probe send back indications that there was life on Mars. Well, and that's, you know, the Viking probe data is still debated in that, you know, there's the one of the guys who was the the developed the experimental package for it insists that it brought back interesting data that could be indicative of life on Mars, and other people say no. And they it was just that, you know, how will the science experiment work when you're bazillions of miles away from Earth and you're measuring an alien world where you're not sure what life should or should not look like? You know, the traces of it. Well, and that's the funny part is is so the Viking lands, the probe sticks in its gizmo, and it comes back like, yeah, probably life. And and weirdly, I guess I guess people short circuit. They're all like, um, well, it says that. But meanwhile, we're clearly looking at a desert. So that was probably a mistake. And that was probably a false positive was essentially what the scientists said. Well, there was like, uh, I forget what, it, you know, the the. You know, like I say, had a heating element that was supposed to heat something up, and it got, you know, it was a different result than what you would expect, but it wasn't like a, a, a binary life or no life kind of thing. It was something different. You could be like, well, maybe that is in a different form. And, you know, since then, you know, we've been finding life in very, very odd places. And uh, life, you know, on Earth, you know, you go to those at the Akami Desert where it looks totally barren, and then you dig, just, just dig into the pores of rock. And you find life living inside of there. You look at the surface, you may not find anything. Maybe some lichens or something, lichens or something. But you know, other than that, you're not going to find anything. But deep inside, there's life. Well, so. and and in defense of uh, of of the ain't no life on Mars argument, Mars is exceptional. I mean, even even here on Earth, that sounds like a Jamiroquai album. <laughs> yes, ain't no life on Mars. <laughs> ain't no life on Mars. But it's like you know, here here on Earth, we find life everywhere. So so we think, well, maybe it is everywhere. But meanwhile, it's like you got you got radiation. It's baked dry. You got no magnetic shield protecting it. You got no significant oxygen for it to breathe. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh, I don't know though. On the flip side, be freaking rad. Martian bi- microbes. So we dig in there and we find a lot of organic molecules. We find all the, you know, the, 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 the full package that we can expect to see of complex organic molecules. Uh, what's our reaction? Um, I, I, I don't know if we discussed this or not, but it's like weirdly all of the, I, to be honest, I think our reaction will be a lot like when we found the David Bowie song. It'll be a lot like when we found the the Higgs boson or the Higgs-like boson. It's like a, many of the most fundamental, most important scientific and philosophical breakthroughs oftentimes does nothing to affect the price of milk here on planet Earth. You know, it's like we'll, we'll go back to work and we'll do our things. But on the flip side, I mean, that is that's, that's well, let me, huge. Let me play uh, devil's advocate, though. The, the problem with the Higgs boson is... Nobody understands it. You know, it, it's this, you can, you know, many science writers will write these, when they get into these torturous analogies, imagine you're in a room full of people and you walk through there and the tract of people turn, it's like, forget yeah. it. You know, imagine you're, you're, you've you're, taught cats to act as parliament. And yeah. what? It's, it's, yeah, it's such a, it's such a complicated thing in some ways to sort of wrap your head around. And then uh, life, we understand life, we get. You know, something grows, and we, you know, there you get into these borderlines of what's life and what's not life. But I think that's a little, I'd say it's a little more, you're right, it's not going to affect the price of milk, but it does when you go look outside. You go, holy cow, when I look at the stars, what am I seeing? And am I seeing a vast, dead desert 
or am I seeing just a, a I'm seeing real estate as far as the eye can see real estate for mankind for here well, to eternity I mean I'm like kind of ocean, in between. I said the floor I'm, of the ocean. We used to think the ocean floor was a desert. Desert. You know, we used to think. Okay. Well, and tell me but, this. But finding that, do we think about the ocean any different? I guess. Yeah. Well, okay. Tell me which you would rather have. Because understand, let's say, let's say there is rich, detailed life on, uh, you know, diver rich and diverse life on the surface of Mars. That would be a total bummer because it's going to make it way hard, and it's going to make it a big question of whether or not it's appropriate for us to go sending our our western invading microorganisms into the surface of mars all of a sudden it's one of those things where it's like well what what are appropriate actions to take to continue to investigate you got to be super delicate like part of me wants it to be a desert so then we could just march in and start setting up our tents and be like we own this bitch I mean, that's if you care about microbes, that anybody would get weird about it. Like, there's microbes all over the place. Like, all, everything we do involves us. In oh, no, no, no. But that's that's different. Like, the, this completely independent type form of life uh, developed completely independent or relatively independently from planet Earth. Like, you can't you can't just go stomping on that. There, there's too much opportunity to learn Watch from it. it. I, I <laughs> think that <laughs> we've cross-pollinated and, you know, and, and contaminated for a billion years. Yeah, it's all we do. That's our move. Yeah, we've we've. we've you, you, you don't think you don't think there would be a movement to protect? Uh, oh, the, sure. This one opportunity. Sure. Oh, there'll be a movement. Is it going to be a movement that will stem the movement of hey, let's live on Mars? No. Hmm. I mean, I it might that, be a yeah. Thing. There's only going to be so much. You we we get all environmental and protective when you reach a certain point where you have a, enough resources to have those options. So, you know, you create the Sierra, you know, there's no Sierra Club in a poor country. You know, poor people are too worried about food and this. When we want to go to Mars. What's, what's the, uh, what was the, having just read the uh, uh, Rational Optimist, I think they said it was like, uh, I'm going to make up this number. It was either 2000 or $5,000 per year. Once, once the average income crosses that threshold, all of a sudden people want to spend money and, and change the economic development so they're not trash, you know, so they don't have to put up mm -hmm. with smog anymore. Yeah, China's reaching that point. Uh, I think that I think that you're going to have a, you know the the people who are going to have the ability and drive to go to Mars are going to want to be protective of Mars and not going to want to try to contaminate too much. And how much can we contaminate in the short term, given just the radically different ecosystems we're coming from? Well, and and also, uh, yeah, and, and we talked about this before, but in Kim Stanley Robinson's Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, you know, there's this this fight between people who who feel like it's mankind's destiny to terraform Mars, and meanwhile, the geologists who are there because they love uh, unlocking the secrets buried within the rocks of Mars, and they feel like the very act of terraforming is to destroy this. So essentially, you have geologists who want to preserve, you know, representing the Earth style green movement. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, do you, do you guys just feel like like that noise is going to go away and and terraform I, I, all the way? I, I mean, ahead, I, I guess I, I just think that paramount to everything that like all of these will be part of the calculus. We will talk about it. We will discuss it. It will affect on some level our decision making process. But the engine, the thing that makes it a conflict, is our drive to be a multi-planet species and we're going to figure out how to do it like yeah, I, you know i think we'll colonize i don't i'm, I'm kind of nay on the terraforming oh um, you think you think we'll just go and build a bunch of domes and uh yeah, domes and stuff i don't the terraforming thing i think that that would be kind of a to me that'd be kind of a loss when there's so many other places to live within our solar system well, like, like, where else could we live in our solar system? I guess asteroids, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's, asteroids. there's enough party free asteroids. floating matter. There's enough free floating party matter. Party rockets floating through of, space. There's enough free floating matter out there besides our planets and moons to make basically a million Earths worth of surface area. Yeah. Uh, now, has there been any experiments with with creating artificial gravity by by rotation? Like, it seems like. It seems we, like that would be good on paper, but in real life, you would just get sick and your inner ear would be all messed well, up. It depends upon how the size of this. Now, we've done that with like uh, 
the Apollo program, some of those, you know, lifting bodies where we've spun them in to see, you know, you, you cling to the surface. You just, the bigger the bigger the sphere, or the bigger the cylinder, the less you have that effect. You, you know, the less you get sick or whatever because your your head is spinning slower than your feet. You know, you the bigger it is, the less of a problem. But, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, we need to do more experiments on that. But, I mean, that that is in every single testable way gravity. Wow. Yeah, I wonder if you would just be able to adapt to it because I know that uh, the, uh, the human do body does some pretty pretty rad things to adapt to just about anything. However, you know, I know that uh, uh, Richard Garriott, when he was talking about his experience in the International Space Station, that uh, I forget what percentage he talks about, but he says for a significant number of people, it's just a headache. Like they they get in, they 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 don't know until they get up there. They show up and they just develop a headache, and they have that headache the entire run on the space station and it sucks all the time yeah well the way i would imagine is we would we would take a couple kilometer size asteroids tether them together and then rotate them around each other and have g-like gravity and you live inside and have it or whatever before then the next generation start building cylinders and then orbital habitats and using things like plasma windows to hold an atmosphere and that's all within existing technology not using unobtainium or some sort of magical science fiction thing sure sure yeah like we're not going to live in space by walking on coals with Tony Robbins. <laughs> no, dude, you says you. I went to a seminar. He said, "If you want to live in space, give me five hundred dollars." Oddly enough, walk. when people come back from space, they say the smell is like burnt plastic and singe, which is not unlike the smell at Anthony Robbins seminar. <laughs> Wait a minute. They nice. they, they they say like uh, they say Planet Earth smells like burnt cinders. No, people. You know, when you come back and you open up the spacecraft and all that. Oh, got it. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, People man. who be in space smell like this. <laughs> we got a sponsor? Hell yeah. Uh, there's a frightening new project that needs your help over at Kickstarter. It's called Basement Bugs. Yes, Basement Bugs. It's about a trapped tenant in the basement of his creepy apartment building that's forced to suffer the gnawing bugs that are all around him. Here's the deal. You can go on over to Kickstarter, search for Basement Bugs. It's by Barnaby Badia. Uh, they need $31,000. They only got nine more days to do this. That's at the recording time of the Weird Things. Weird Things will come out on Wednesday, so that'll be two days uh, less than that. So or actually, we're probably one day because it's East Coast. So um, they're, they're already, they're almost halfway there right now with nine days to go. Yeah, so they need to get uh, 31000 by August 2nd. It's a short film. Um, you know, I'll tell you what, get all up in there, read about it. You got all sorts of things. 10 bucks gets you thank you credit in the film. Let's scroll on down. Let's see what you get for $4,000. How about $25, poster? you get a poster. But, 65, you get a poster, a t-shirt, special thanks on film, a DVD and a digital copy of the film. Yeah. 150, you get a poster, a t-shirt, DVD copy. Screening invitation, two invites for the screening. Twenty five hundred. Yeah, you get dinner with Denzel Whitaker, Nick Covio, Barnaby Badia, and special thanks. Listen, head on over or just email them if you're interested in the movie and you want to help out in any way you possibly can. Basementbugsfilm at gmail dot com. But uh, check it out. It uh, sounds like cool stuff. Hey, and anyone who sponsors this podcast, it's one of our own. So this is one of ours trying to make a movie. Yeah. Let's make some dreams come true. Sounds dope to me. Gentlemen, time for picks. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this. This is normally, like, especially this summer, there's been a lot of movies that have come out this summer. We've talked about the movies. Uh, I know me and Brian have seen Batman. The, Have you seen the, the Batman, Batman? The Batman, Andrew? Not yet. No. All right. So we'll we'll wait. We'll table our Batman Rising uh, conversation for for another. I'll tell you what, and, and this may be a retread here, but there's a fan film that came out this past week for Why the Last Man. Did you see this, Justin? No, I didn't. I thought you were going to say the Punisher one. No, 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 no. Hold on. Let me do. Why the last man? Um, somebody, somebody put together. It's a twenty-minute movie. And first of all, if you have never seen, uh, if you've never read Why the Last Man, it's a fantastic comic book written by Brian K. Vaughn. Uh, published it under I think Vertigo Comics does it. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it is uh, is great. Um, I I read the first half of it on my own dime, and Justin liked it so much. You physically mailed me your copies of the comic, all your trades. Yeah, so I, I bought all the it. trades. But uh, it, this, uh, if, if you look at this thing, uh, it's it's called Why the Last Man Rising. It's a fan film, and it's one of these weird cases where the movie is so good that it short circuits your fan film perceptions it looks so good that you start to judge it as if it's a you know a fox pilot that you're looking at uh i don't know how much money they spent on it but it's uh this is from uh ign partnered with a a guy um oh let me get his name i can't find it but but any uh wait i should really find it um brr. christian cord yes cordera? yes that's it christian cordera but uh, but man, if you look at it, it's got all the themes of of misogyny straight from the comic book. Uh, it sort of jumps forward uh, from the point that uh, the plot, of course, for the book is that uh, is that all the men die on planet Earth all at the exact same time, except for one person, sort of a sort of slacker magician named Yorick, who's got a pet monkey named Ampersand. Who um, who survives and wants to find his sister out on the west coast? But look at this, Justin. I mean, this thing's got like a budget budget. Yeah, no, I'm watching uh, watching it now. I haven't seen it. You know, it, it looks to be like uh, samplings from, I guess, like the, probably the first trade paperback. Yeah, I, I don't know how many issues that would be, but kind of like select scenes from there. Yeah. Uh, but no, yeah, no, it looks it looks very like more than just kind of well, I, I guess some some things look more fan filmy than others. But well, uh, but it, it look I, I'm very excited to watch it, no matter what it is. I've always said I like the things I like, I like more of. I like people to do more of and I it, my threshold is very low for, you know, what I will watch of things. So if it's like if my six-year-old little brother said that he made a fan film of Why the Last Man, I would happily watch it. So I'm very excited to watch well, this. And the, the action far- scenes uh, are are excellent. There's a couple of uh, parts where you could tell like some miking issues or whatever, but it's just like uh, definitely check it out. And if you haven't read Why the Last Man, definitely read Why the Last Man. Um, it, it's a bit heavy. The comic I found was a little bit heavy-handed and hyper-focused on the gender roles um, of society and what it means, you know, what is it good that men are all gone because men are all jerks or not? But uh, but the fact Preach that it, sister. the fact that they had a beginning, a middle, and a, and the end, and it just really swept me up the entire time. Uh, I thought it was fascinating. Well, I mean, all right, here here's the th- and this kind of uh, dovetails into my pick but like i've i've kind of just come to realize that even amazing comic series they just hit a point where like either they kind of like the nature of that sort of production kind of gets to them and they're just like they kind of wobble a little bit and the story gets fatty and weird or or starts relying on themes that are maybe overused or uh they've they've hit before and it starts to strike the wrong note um, and the best kind of adjust and then refocus their story and keep going. Uh, that was kind of as much as I love Lock and Key, that was really where I, I kind of felt like I sort of stopped enjoying Lock and Key uh, as much as, as I, I had because it sort of, you know, the, the, the central momentum sort of wobbled a little bit. Same thing with Why the Last Man. Why the Last Man went through, you know, uh, a couple, you know, uh, you know, a little run where it just wasn't kind of where... It, it was, and then thankfully for me, at least I got back there. But I'm reading a book now that I very, very, very much enjoy. It's called The Hundred Bullets. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah, you and I talked about this briefly, right? No, it was actually Brett that I spoke Brett, to. Who, who is like, uh, again, Brett is pretty much like the, the evangelist of comics in my life right now because he just – Reads them and then just they didn't even give them to me. He literally just throws them at me. Well, and and the way Brett described it to me, what he liked so much about this, and you can you can give me a second opinion on this. What he said he liked about it was that you started off the first issue 
with this conceit. And you're like, oh, I get it. This is going to be the conceit of the book is that it's going to go through each of these hundred bullets. And then like it just bails on it a few issues in and, and it gets way, way more interesting as a result. Is that the is that the fact? Um, no. Well, that's not how I would describe it. I don't think it's necessarily wrong, but, um, well, uh, basically, well here's, here, here's the conceit. The okay. conceit is this, and this is not, I mean, I think this is legit to say, uh, there's a man who gives you a briefcase with a untraceable gun and a hundred untraceable bullets. And he explains a problem that has befallen your life. And these are like serious problems. Like, you know, a loved one is dead or, you know, your life was ruined and tells you who did it, gives you irrefutable proof that they did do it. Right. And then gives you, or then informs you that whatever you decide to do, you are in, in the course of this, of you deciding what you're going to do up to murder, um, you are untouchable by the law and you can like get popped by the cops and they will within 12 hours release you from from jail you know uh and so you have basically just to decide what you want to do and like that concept you know obviously is very kind of uh is very stylized and uh you know definitely something where i think if you looked at it you could be like oh okay well somebody who was halfway clever and thought of that idea and that's what the the comic's going to be and you know i will say that that is kind of half interesting and i really liked it but what i like about it especially in terms of the problems that i've had and not problems but like where i've not liked other great comic series that i've liked uh is that whenever the momentum of their main plot which is far greater and and it goes into the machinations of why this guy is running around and how he has this power um whenever that momentum they kind of want to take a break from that momentum they just go into really cool interesting sort of one-off stories about this guy offering people this choice and it really made me think a lot uh, as i was reading it like man this is a fantastic television premise like when when all we've seen and we've seen another three or four of them this year that that are on especially a network television that are just crappy television premises like television premises that are like they, they be okay movie premises and and they they're going to expand them forever uh you know while while we keep churning out those a really fantastic premise like this which i guess it ended its run in 2009 uh has kind of sat there but now showtime optioned it so they're going to make it and i'm very happy about that but check it out 100 bullets 100 bullets oh, okay all right uh pick um I just watched two movies, and neither one of them do I want to recommend because I was bored. But one I brought back, and the other one I just couldn't get over the hype. Uh, Vegas show. I was in Vegas last week. But can we, you're not going to trash the movies. I want to hear what movies you want to trash. Yeah, uh, I never trash movie? movies. Oh, all right. Um, went and saw. Really enjoyed. Hadn't seen it in two years. Was the David Copperfield show? He's got some new stuff in his show. Really, really dug it. Really enjoyed God, seeing it that just show. Fl- and and it, it was even better being a magician seeing it because I was fooled very badly by a few routines. It's very, very good. And what's neat too is that like when he's in Vegas, he does this sort of very fast-paced, condensed show. You know, and that that it's just this it move, move, moves from the stuff. And uh, very, very much enjoyed it. And, you know, been, you know, I've been like Brian and I both been fans of him for years. And it was just, he was just on Oprah, on Oprah's next chapter, talking about his life and all that. Very, very interesting, you know, stuff that I'd never heard. And then, you know, going to see his show live again. Uh, fantastic. So if you're in Vegas, go check out David Copperfield. He's, he's got charisma that is superhuman, right? Oh, like yeah. he's just, he's just got an otherworldly kind of charisma that is is just titanic it's just it's not you know he's not only is he such an amazingly talented magician and performer but like it's just it's one of those things where you go and and watch you watch his show and you realize like that's a different class of human that kind of entertainer is a different class of human there's a ton of his stuff on youtube and you can go back and watch his first 
His first national TV appearance, I don't know if that's up there, was called Magic of the Roxy. But then you watch it when he did his ABC, before he did the CBS series, he did an ABC special. He's 20. He's 20 years old. Holy he's he's cow. there with like Cindy Williams and a bunch of other people. And then they're introducing like what's going to be the new fall lineup. And you like Carter Country, you know, shows you never even remember or heard of. And then it's worth it for watching that alone. But check, look at what he could do at 20 years old. And I don't think there's still a magician to the day that can match that. Wow. Yeah. He's he's awesome. Yeah, it's been probably about a year since I've seen the show, but it was it was amazing. But I actually just went and saw it. She was just in Vegas and saw it and loved it. Thought it was amazing. Right on. Gentlemen, somewhere out there he lurks on a mountainside, <laughs> watching for danger. Goat man. Somebody uh somebody sent me this tweet of this photo of this episode of weird things it's got the mars rover it's got goats walking on coals is that a hugh jackman there with the uh i don't know who it is it's very disturbing but i love it (laughs) our fans are weird (laughs) yeah they are yes i wouldn't trade them for the world the goat on coals that wins that wins (laughs) (laughs) his little goat feet are on fire getting ready to goat sue no it's been weird dandy weird it's been weird (laughs) it's been weird are we over (laughs) yeah we're over that was a good one (laughs) i uh i i'm still singing you know my uh mouse elvis voice the justin oh my god (laughs) yes (laughs) justin is sincerely deeply in love with mouse elvis Mouse Elvis is the only thing I ever want to do. Like I, I, I just want to. I, I, I kind of. I keep. I find myself trying to veer conversations into Mouse Elvis just so I can do the. <laughs> we can go on together. <laughs> Everybody, Mouse Elvis. Where's this I was, was going to suggest for the last one, but I'm like, now nah, it'd be too much. Just to go get Elvis doing that, and then use the modulator in the mouse voice, and so as the thing <laughs> ends, just have the whole track. Yes. Oh, Elvis, I mean, like, I'll tell you, it's funny, we were talking about, like, Copperfield, but, like, I, I kind of feel like if you look at, like, I was fascinated. A while ago, I got a a box set of um, Frank Sinatra, and it was all Frank Sinatra in Vegas over various periods of his of his career. And, like, it's so fascinating to me, like, from super young like absolutely uh you know just like with a voice the likes of which you know was was very very rare um to like later when you know he just he he would kill in just a completely different way like there's just uh, you know there, there are kinds of performers that no matter what no matter what they're interested in no matter what part of their act they care the most about at that particular moment they find a way to build what they do into that and just like and just kill it just it, it's just second nature for them to just you know uh absolutely just make the crowd love them by any means necessary and and you know like elvis is certainly if you look at elvis throughout the years you know like he, he just he had that and i very much think copperfield's very much in that mold uh fielding west did you ever hear his frank sinatra story no so Fielding West, great magician, really neat guy. He was taught he was he was I forgot where he's like some casino or some place like you know, some wherever and and he needed to go down a hallway and his friend says, Oh no, don't go down there, like Sinatra's people are down there, whatever. And he's like, I gotta go take care of some. So he goes down the hallway and some goon like guy grabs him, shoves him up against the wall, forces his head against the wall and says, if you turn around, I'm going to kill you, right? And what? Frank Sinatra comes walking down the hallway. And then once Frank Sinatra's done, you know, they let him go. Fielding walks out of the hallway and his friend goes, what are, friend, you know, friend goes, what's with your face? And Fielding is grinning. He goes, I just saw Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, all right, gentlemen, I'd hate to call it early, but. Um... Then don't. Well, but but it's it's not early. It's past midnight. It's it's twelve twelve, and I got up. Uh, uh, I was up till three a.m. chatting with someone about the Dark Knight, and then I watched Breaking Bad, and then I got up at seven a.m. with the kids, and then 
I played. Oh, oh, let me, let me, let me tease this business. Um, there's a little game. Right, let's try to merge our heads here. <laughs> and then give your give your update. But Andrew, you got to move your mouth too while Brian's talking. <laughs> Go ahead. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> What's your update, Brian? Uh, there's a game that you may know that I like called Orcs Must Die, and it's got a sequel called Orcs Must Die 2. And Man, for... one side of your face is you're giving a really wry elbow or uh, <laughs> eyebrow raise that is really giving this Orcs Must Die 2 tease an erotic charge. Well, the, the important thing is <laughs> it looks like... Oh, Brian. It looks like... It looks like uh, they've given me a code for the pre-release copy of Orcs Must Die 2. And this Thursday, it looks like i uh, that's when Embargo gets lifted and I can do a playthrough of Orcs Must Die 2 on the live stream. With, with We're trying to set it up with one of the devs, the guys who created the game. So that would be way, <laughs> way fun. I'm no longer okay with this. <laughs> Um, dude, that's awesome. Also, remember tomorrow, Get Set Go live from studio uh, for NSFW show. Um, and also, one week from tomorrow, big release for the book hoax. All right. Um, I'll, I'll hang up if we're watching this. Because <laughs> uh, it's not good. Dude. I just don't want to get in trouble. Uh, the, um, it was so fun to watch Rudy Kobe explode with excitement about this. He's a very exuberant gentleman. He Rudy. certainly is. He spent all day praising the Wonder Ball. Uh, okay. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.